In lecture seven, we're going to look at the connection between forward to inverse kinematics. And we're going to use this example of three link robot here, where it has two revolute joints and a prismatic joint. And we're going to look at how we can first construct the forward kinematics for this. And then you'll notice something new in this picture because I've sketched out the workspace of this robot when I put some joint limits on how far each of the joints can move. It's very common that robots have limits on how far their joints move. Your body has certain limits how far you can move your, your fingers. And so that defines a workspace that you can reach. And so inverse kinematics says, given that there's some point inside this workspace, how do I get there? And then moreover, how do I know which points are actually in my workspace? And we're going to have an introduction to that today. So we're going to start with the forward kinematics of this robot. And so the first thing we need to do is to add all of the coordinate frames. We're going to start by drawing in where the axis of rotation. So I've got an axis of rotation around this waist. Got another axis of rotation coming out here. And then I've got an axis of movement. The point that I care about is where this orange dot is. So my axis of movement, my next Z axis is here. So this is Z0. This one here is Z1. This over here is Z2. We're going to say that the end effector is also going to be in the same direction. That's Z3. So now we have to go through here and we have to add the X axis. So my X axis, remember the first thing I need to do is assign an origin. It makes sense to put that on the base, but it would depend on your application. So here's my origin. I'm going to have my X0 coming out this way, which means to make a right handed frame then my Y zero is coming out this way. Next, let's look at these two axes that we have. So I've got my Z zero axis is coming up through here and my Z one axis is coming through there. They intersect. Since they intersect, that has to be my next origin. So I'm going to put a dot there that is O one. And then my X axis has to be perpendicular to both my Z zero and my Z one. I only have two options. Either my X zero is going to come out this way or it comes out this way. I'm going to pick this one coming through here, but that is a, a freedom that I can have. So there's my X one, which means that my Y zero is going to be a right handed frame. So there is Y zero coming out there. Next, we look at our intersection. Well, we've got that both Z one and Z two, they are parallel to each other. So that means that I could pick a point anywhere along these ladder rungs between them. In order to avoid having extra parameters in my DH table, I'm going to make this one on that same plane as O1. Here is my O2. And then my X axis, I, I don't have as much freedom in this because remember our X axis has to travel along this line. So this line along this common normal is going to come up through here. I hit the origin and then extend. This is my X2 to make a right handed frame. My Y2 is going to come here. And then I have a translation because this is a, a D joint here, which means that I've got some freedom here. I'm going to make this just be a translation of the previous axis. So right here is going to be my X three and then my Y three. So now it's time to go through here and assign the distances that I move on this. So let's start filling in our DH table. We've got three lengths, one, two, and three. We know that we have a theta one star. And we have a theta two star and we have a D three star for my prismatic joint. We have to fill in the rest of these parameters. Let's go ahead and let's draw in what those parameters are that I just drew. So if I take my X one and I drop it down here then the angle that I spin around my Z zero axis, that is my theta one. Similarly, my distance that I rotate around Z one from X one to X two, that right there is my theta two. And then this distance that I move in and out along my prismatic joint is D three star. So next we need to look at what is R one. Well, R one is a distance radially that we move along our X one. And since these points are at the same origin, that's going to be zero. My alpha is a twist that I do around X one to go from this one was Z zero to Z one. I'm going to revolve this direction, my positive convention, that is going to be my alpha one. And you can see there that it's 90 degrees or pi over two. My D is the distance I translate along my previous Z axis. And so that is 
this distance from here to here is D1. I'm going to write it as D1. And so my next link is this link 2. And we'll notice that we have this radial offset because our two z-axes are parallel. So there's zero twist between them. But I have offset it. And I have offset it this distance, which is R2. So some R2 value I've offset. But I put everything. I had no translation along my z-axis. So zero here. And then my D3, my two frames are parallel to each other. They've just been translated. And I see that I've got a little bit of an error here. Sorry about that. This right here is D3 star, and I've got zero everywhere else on this. And now I have enough that I can build my A-frames. Remember, you've got a formula for these A-frames. So this homogeneous transform that we build is going to be a 4 by 4 matrix. So I can write in my little dashed lines. I know that it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. And then what I can see here is that my Y0, my, oh, I do have another typo there. Sorry about that. My Y1 is pointed along the direction of my original Z0. So I can write that as 0, 0, 1. My X1 is going to be rotated by theta. And so my X1 is going to be cosine of 1, sine of 1, and 0 elements in the Z axis. Whereas my new Z axis is also going to be rotated, but it'll be 90 degrees behind the X axis. So that's going to be sine 1, negative cosine 1, 0. And then the final thing we want to know is where is this O1? This is O1. And you'll notice the only thing that's happened is it's been translated upwards by D1. So it's 0, 0, D1. And it's time to do my A2. And A2 is what's the translation from frame 1 to frame 2? Again, we can put our easy things in there. We know we're going to have a 0, 0, 0, 1 on the bottom. And now we want to look at where are my different axes. So the first axis that I care about is this x2 axis. So my x2 axis is going to be in the same plane as x1, y1, just slightly rotated. So since it's all in that plane, I'm going to have my cosine 2, sine 2, 0. My y is also going to be in that same plane. So it's going to have my negative sine 2, cos 2, 0. Then my z2 is parallel to my z1. And so it's going to just be 0, 0, 1. Then I want to know where is my o2 with relationship to my previous frame. And so this one has no d offset but it does have a uh, rotation. So we're going to have our C2 sine 2 there. Final frame to worry about is my A3. Again, I can put my easy stuff in here. 0, 0, 0, 1. This one, there's no rotation because my X is parallel to my X3. My Y2 is parallel to my Y3. My Z2 is parallel to my Z3. The only difference that I have is this D3 offset. So this frame is delightfully simple. To write, we've got our identity matrix here, and then 0, 0, D3, star. And those are our transformation matrices. And we take those and we multiply them together. I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you, and I'm just going to show you the answer, because this is the answer we want to talk about. So the first thing I do is I put in my easy values, because we always are going to have some easy values. And now we want to look at what this matrix tells us. So I want to remind you that what's it telling us is where is my x3 in terms of x0. That's what this first column is. And so you can see that it's it can be rotated. And the x component is c1, c2. And the y component is s1, c2. And then finally, s2 is how high it is. Next we want to look at is where is this y3 in relationship to y0. So this one, we've got a negative cosine 1, sine 2, and a negative sine 1, sine 2, and then a cosine 2. Finally, we want to look at where is z3 in terms of z0. One of the interesting you see is that it's always perpendicular. So we can write this in. We've got it's just sine 1, cosine 1, and 0. This is always perpendicular. 
Finally, we want to know where is this final point, this origin O3, with regards to the base frame. And so we'll start with the x component of that. The x component of that is going to be given by cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, plus a sine 1 d3 star. So let's look at where those components come from. So this first component takes us all the way out to this point here, and the second component takes us farther outwards in the x direction. The y component is going to be very similar. First we want to know how far have we moved in y0 in this component. We could drop that down. That distance we've moved out there is going to be just the sine of 1 times the cosine of 2. Cosine of 2 tells you what is this projection of this arm. It gets shorter as we rotate theta 2 upwards, and sine 1 is giving the component in the y direction. And then we have our extent that we go out here, which is going to be a minus cosine 1 d3 star. Our final component is how tall is this point? How far is it in the z0 axis? We first have that we're stepping upwards by one unit to get to this point over here, and then our height is totally dependent on what theta 2 is. So that's going to be plus the sine of theta 2. So now we have our forward kinematics. And remember, this column here tells us what direction is x3 with relationship to my base coordinate frame. This is what direction is my y3 with relationship to the base frame. This is where is my z3 with relationship to the base frame. And these components tell us what is this point in my x, my y, and my z in order to get there. So now we've done forward kinematics, which means we can map how these joint variables get expressed into the transformation function. It's easy to see as I move this d over here, you can see that it directly is changing this d. As I rotate my theta 1, then I get this rotation matrix here, and I'm also changing the position of this end effector. The second part of the lecture is going to talk about how we can go from this position of this end effector and figure out what these joints are. <music>